Hi, it's Jeff Alpin, The Big Game Hunter, and welcome to Job Search TV. As many of you know, from time to time, I bring on a guest expert to talk with you about some element of job search or career. And today I've got John Turnoff, who's got a great TEDx talk that I have a link to in the show notes. I'll also have a link to his book called Boomer Reinvention. This interview is not specifically geared toward boomers. It's about career transition in general and how to start moving forward in your career so that in this way you don't wind up being stuck and, um, shall we say, career out of sorts. Hope you enjoy this. And in the meantime, let's get going. So my guest today is John Tarnoff, the author of, look over on the right-hand side of the screen, Boomer Reinvention. And although that's going to be a piece of what we talk about, it's really going to be information independent of generation that I think you'll find very helpful. John, welcome, and why don't you introduce yourself to the audience, okay? Thanks so much. Great to be here. So, hi, everybody. Um, my name is John Tarnoff. I live in Los Angeles, California. I am a career transition coach, which is a second act career for myself. Um, I started out as a executive and uh, film producer in the movie business here in Los Angeles. Uh, born and raised in New York, I had the movie bug early on, uh, came out to figure out how that was gonna work and uh, did that for about 35 years till about 2010. And in the last 10 years, um, uh, particularly after I took a second degree as a uh, behavioral psychologist, I found myself more and more drawn into not so much the content, and how to get the content off the ground, but about the people and what motivates the people to make the content. And that kind of propelled me into a career focused on education and training, which I did in my last job working for a great company, DreamWorks Animation, uh, for most of the 2010s. And I got really focused on this area and committed to this area and, and kind of rolled out of DreamWorks with the idea that this was going to be my second act career. And uh, I didn't necessarily think I was going to get into the career coaching business. And that happened because I was asked to give a TEDx talk in 2012. And the topic was a general topic. It was about transformation. And, and I by, thought that And by the way, folks, the video, the, the TEDx talk is, is entitled, and for the boomers, you'll get this, the kids are all right. The kids are still all right. Still all right. Thank you very right. much. And, I, and, I, and The Who is one of my favorite bands, and I talk about the song and about you know, this idea that even after the recession, when a lot of people then, 2012, and still today, in many cases, are, are recovering from the hit that we took in 2008, 2009, I wanted to create this positive message about how we can push back against ageism and the general business paradigm that says, oh, you're 65, you need to retire. But here's the deal. Retire to what? Uh, we lost a lot of our nest egg in the recession. It's hard to come back. Uh, property values went down. Uh, a lot of us packed and sold. Uh, and it's been harder and harder for us as we get into our 50s and definitely into our 60s to actually get a job because people don't want to hire older people. But guess what? We're living longer. Life is getting more expensive. So what are we supposed to do? And well, for I think you, we have to go ahead. And for, you, and for you Gen X people, welcome to your future. Well, and, yeah. I mean, and, Gen and X the, is, now, is now definitely into their 50s. They're 55 so, at the oldest part of the cohort now. Yeah. And as a result, this conversation could just as well as be for you. So you have a chance to plan for it and exactly. not get hung out to dry like many right. of the boomers allowed themselves right. to do. Well, interestingly, I, I have coached a number of people in their 40s who come to me and they say, look, I know you tend to work with you know, mid to late career uh, uh, professionals, but I don't want to grow. I don't want to wake up at 55 and think, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And I've just been you know, bought out or downsized or whatever. I want to have more control over my career destiny. So that's, that's how I got into this. And uh, so I did this TEDx talk and put together these these five steps around uh, career reinvention. And part of it is based on the work that I did in my psychology training. But another part of it comes out of the, the 
fact that I was in a very volatile business. Movie business, as everyone knows, is a kind of an up and down, topsy turvy business. You're trying to second guess the future taste of the public, right? So, you know, how many mistakes can you make there? It happens all the time. You hear about these big budget movies that flop. Well, it's not because people are dumb or, or, or you know, weren't trying to figure these things out. So, as a result of this, I had a lot of jobs over my 35 years in entertainment. Some of them because I got another offer, some of them because something ended, a film that I produced was, was done or a consulting gig was, was complete. But seven of the 18 jobs that I had over those 35 years, I was fired. So, right, so in the TEDx talk, I joke about the fact, and this has kind of become a bit of a trademark for me since then, that in my career, doing the math, I've been fired 39% of the time. So, what a you, always, you should always feel always shame for yourself. All that's these, the point. All Thank these you. failures you've had. That's How terrible. Point. What's that's wrong with you, John? Right. And that's the world that, that we grow up with, right? And, and I remember my late mom, you know, bless her, uh, very often I, I'd kind of blow out of a job or something would happen. And she'd say, why do you have such a hard time keeping a job? And... <laughs> You know, this is the world we grew up in. We kind of expected that we would be in one company forever, right? You get out of, out of school, you go to work for a company, whether it's white collar or blue collar, the expectation was you needed to stay in that job as long as you could, 40 years. And then they'd give you the gold watch, you'd have a pension, and you could kind of sail off into this life of leisure. And that, that was a bubble in time. It, it, it kind of didn't happen before the beginning of the 20th century, and it's certainly not happening now in the 21st century. So as a result of that, that resilience that I built up in, in working in entertainment, I feel like I got some, some pointers to share about how to be resilient, how to reinvent yourself and, um, and what the process is. And I think it's interesting because it's obvious that the system doesn't work that way anymore. Stopped working that way a long time ago. But I think the young'uns, you know, that is those who, are not without hair and those who have less gray than you do, right. uh, they're still infected with that nonsensical belief, even That's though there's true. ample witnessing from their parents and their history and perhaps the stories that they've watched on YouTube or listened to from their grandparents about how you can't just work your way up. Every time there's a recession, business turns around and goes, you. Let's, let's all be in the conference room. We've got HR there. Right. As, as soon as you hear right. the magic words, HR is waiting for you in the conference room, you might as well just put it, your stuff in a box. Just, just go room. right just right out the front door. You know, right. Mail me the check. Right. So given the fact that we've all been infected with this propaganda from institutions that we're supposed to stay there and work our way up and have loyalty to the organization, even though there's no none reciprocated to us, We've got to be responsible for our own careers. No exactly one's gonna, right. No one's going to look out for our interests. Exactly right. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm constantly pushing back against people, and I, I do a lot of uh, engagement on LinkedIn uh, and on, you know, for, on my own account, but also on a lot of other uh, people's accounts uh, about this topic. And every once in a while, there's going to be someone who's going to rant about what companies should do and what the government should do to protect older workers and how the situation is untenable. And, and it's a, I hate to say it, but it's a victim consciousness approach, right? When you're in this situation, you, you can't expect that big institutions, big companies that are invested in the same old HR practice that they've been doing for years uh, that they're going to turn around on a dime. They're, they're big tankers, right? And it's going to be hard to turn them around, even if there is this cognitive disconnect within the company about how things do work, how things should work, about what company culture is supposed to be, the aspirational mission statement versus the way it actually happens on the ground. And at the end of the day, people need the jobs. So it's hard for them to push back against these outdated practices. And thus, we're going to talk about ways that you can start taking control of your career, no matter where you are in the life cycle of your career. Because the fact is, folks, you know, John and I may 
the gray beards at this point. But the fact is, eventually, if you're lucky, you wind up in this position. And thus, you know, I'll speak from the perspective of LinkedIn member 7653 of what's currently 650 million people on the platform. You know, I laid a foundation early in my career for building a substantial network of people that I could reach out to because I recognize that without your network, you're just another slob in the marketplace right. with nothing to differentiate you. You're another six-second resume, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the amount of time a recruiter is going to spend looking at your resume if they ever get it because it's going through the scanner before. Right. So you spoke about a couple of things that people can be doing proactively to organize their career, their search, plan and take control of their career. So right. I'm, I'm going to do this as number one. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I think the first thing that, that people need to understand about making a career transition is that the career you want is not out there on a job board in a job description. The career you want is already inside you. And as you get older, particularly, once you've acquired a certain number of skills, you know how your business works, you have a sense of where you fit and what you're good at, you get more from planning it out on the inside and externalizing that knowledge, that self-awareness, that that preference level of what you know you love to do, the stuff that you don't tire of doing, the stuff you look forward to doing every day when you wake up. That's where you got to focus. Too many people do what I call job board porn, which is they are frustrated in their job and they come home at night and they start looking on the job boards for open positions that they could do that they could fit themselves into. This is invariably a prescription for disaster because it denies the value that they have built up, that they can think about, organize, articulate, and, and move forward with. And I'll tell you why this is important, because having been in a position many times in my career of hiring a lot of people, the thing that a hiring manager hates to do more than anything else in the world is write a job description to fill an open position. It is nails on a chalkboard. They don't. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be blunt about it. They don't write job descriptions. Most of the time in most professions, yours may have been different, but in most professions, this is how a job description is created. Someone gives notice on Friday afternoon, they call over to HR and they say, you got that job description we used to hire John? Yeah, he just gave notice and we need to hire a replacement. So could you pull it out of the system, send it to your resources and see if you have it onto my calendar on Tuesday or Wednesday of next week? No one ever updates these things. Right, right, right. It's awful. Exactly. So, you know, the, so I mean, another example of the broken system, right? But you're looking to fit yourself into <clears throat> the constraints of some job description that does not describe you, right? It does, it probably doesn't describe anybody. And, and the proof of the pudding is that 85% of open positions are filled through referrals, right? The job description, the resume, it's kind of meaningless. You want someone to vouch for the candidate you want them to kind of pre-qualify that candidate uh, so that when they walk into your office, you, you have a pretty good sense that they come with this qualitative support from your network. Remember the word network. And I'm going to so, leap in here and say, this is the concept of social proof that we've seen referenced so absolutely. often. It's why Facebook runs these ads that say, John recommends this product. Yeah. Because right. it, helps, it helps cut through the thought process or the evaluation process and get you to the front of the line, which is yeah. where you want to be. Yeah. Ronald Reagan smokes camel cigarettes. <laughs> and look where it got him. <laughs> right? I'm just saying. It's like celebrity endorsements. Like it's been, it's been the, the, the uh, fixture of advertising forever. So, so yeah. So, so that, I mean, 
plenty of stuff's been written about this, about you know, persuasion, I think, you know, the Robert Cialdini book. Um, sure. and, and so, you know, you need to be in a position as a candidate of consolidating as much power as you can uh, around the value proposition that you provide. And so that's really the number one mindset shift that people have to make is to pull it out of that externally focused, oh, what can I fit into out there to the internally focused, what is it that I have to offer? Yeah, makes a huge difference because there's a degree of being solid that comes with that self-awareness that often doesn't exist for the uh, organ grinder's monkey that you otherwise represent yeah. yourself as being yeah. when you're applying for jobs all the yeah. time. Yeah. So, so here's the sidebar on that point. So you're in a job interview, right? The dreaded job interview. And you know that every question is a trap or likely a trap. You have to be prepared for the fact that every question is a trap. And if you are trying to figure out how to anticipate that question and answer that question and follow the lead of the interviewer, you're sunk. Because the interviewer is actually, whether they know it or not, they're really not interested in you checking off the boxes and trying to please them as to what the answer is. If you have a really well-defined value proposition and you know who you are and what you do and you've done your research on the position in the company, then your opportunity in the interview is to school them, if you will, on how you can solve the problems that they are undergoing and that this position is supposed to solve. So you want to take control of the job interview. And the only way to do that is to have a really clear sense of what it is that you do. And the truth is you're not going to nail every job interview. You're not going to get an offer out of every job interview. But if you don't have that really clear sense of what it is that you do and why you're there and what you can provide that's specific to that company or the department or the position, then you're not going to be perceived as a leader, as a dynamic contributor, as someone who is rising above the pool of candidates who are going to kowtow to the interviewer. You got to make yourself special. And thus it becomes less about, do I have these skills versus let me see what I can do to solve your problem. Right. That's right. Becomes because, the thrust of the interview. Yeah. Skills are, are variable, right? Yes. You want to have the skills that you have. You want to keep up on your skills and skills are great. I'm not saying anything against skills, but it's not all about skills. At the end of the day, it's about, the soft skills. It's about your ability to communicate, to collaborate, to, 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 uh, to strategize, to see ahead, to be proactive, right? Your willingness to step up and step in, roll up your sleeves. Uh, and if you've got, if your skills are not quite hitting every single box, well, you can learn those skills or you can find someone to help you. Um, I don't think, recruiters and hiring managers are quite as um, attached to the requirement, the skill requirements on their job descriptions as you would think. I think that's how they get it out there. That's how they kind of weed out, you know, inappropriate candidates. But that's not exactly why they hire people. Sure. Um, and we've got so much more to do and I got to move this conversation forward because yeah. I'm really enjoying this. So. What's the second thing that they need to start focusing on, or the next thing, I should say? Well, the, the next thing is a technique, which is the first technique that I uh, work on with, with clients, and the, the first thing that I encourage everyone to do as part of their career transition process. If they're thinking about, if they've, if they've, if they've been let go and they've got to bounce back, or if they're unhappy or they have a, ambition that is unfulfilled, 
I think everyone needs to do something which it will be probably surprising to many of you, which is keep a journal, keep a daily journal. And this is not your high school diary. This is not where you're confessing, you know, what happened with the kid in class who threw the eraser at you or whatever. This is a self-reflective stream of consciousness capture of the inner dialogue going on inside you. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't necessarily have to relate to the, to the career question at hand on any given day. It can, it can be about how you're going to work your day, the people that you need to contact. But more importantly, I think where it really works and really helps is when you're really capturing the fears, the anxieties, uh, where you're processing through the incompletions that are going on in your life, the questions that you have about what you want to do, about how you could do it, about the kinds of people you want to work with, about what's bugging you about your current job or what, uh, what's bugging you about how they let you go. You need to, and this is a, another big theme for me, you need to reconcile the past in order to create the future. If you have any baggage going on in your head, it's going to interfere with any interaction that you get into around a new job, whether it's a job interview, you know, uh, networking with people. If there are any areas that you don't want to go in or any areas where you're uncomfortable or not clear about who you are, how you feel, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to trip you up. So the daily journal creates this continuity of self-relationship, if you will. And I started doing this probably about 20 years ago uh, when actually, yeah, just about 20 years ago when my, I had a startup in the 90s during the bubble. Uh, I had a partner and we had this great idea and we, you know, everyone was doing startups and dot coms and, and we had this great idea. We raised a bunch of money. We had some really big clients. It was a multimedia uh, startup. And uh, 2001, it all fell apart, right? The stock market dived. We were washed away along with it. And I had no idea what I was going to do. And so every morning I decided I was going to get up early and go into the garage and get on the exercise bike and just pedal away. And I had this little notebook and I just started writing ideas in this notebook and frustrations and, you know, what I wanted to do, why I couldn't do this, uh, you know, uh, uh, that I was afraid to call someone because I didn't think they would take my call or call me back or, you know, whatever was going on. And that interestingly became kind of the foundation for my comeback and for my decision to go back to school and get my psychology degree and then wound up transitioning into the whole DreamWorks thing and the focus on education. And it all started in that journal. And I had no idea when I started the process that that's where it was going to lead me. So you have to be willing to live in, an, in uncertainty and use that journal. I'm saying this is very long winded. I apologize. Use that journal as an opportunity to process through that and find the inner direction. And what's fascinating and, and for me anyway, because I, I do this, I do that I have for years. I encourage people, you know, there tends to be this thing where people tend to think I'm supposed to do it in this way. You know, I have to continue on the path I've been on before. It'd be too difficult to adjust. Stop controlling everything. You're not limiting beliefs. <laughs> limiting beliefs. Yeah. And I think that's right. That's and that's one of the things that the that the journal process can really help you confront is the limiting beliefs that you have about yourself and that you may be stuck and you're accepting the fact that you're stuck. No, that is a limiting belief that's holding you back. And and having that journal, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a, a big entry. I do one handwritten page a day, and it's got to be handwritten. Shouldn't do it with a keyboard. Um, and people kind of look at me askance, like, why? It's so much easier to do it with a keyboard. 
the mystical thing about using your, your, your hand with a pen is that there is some kind of crazy connection between actually physically writing it on the page and unburdening your mind that doesn't happen with the keyboard. There's something with the clatter of the keys and the, 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 the kinesthetics of the keyboard that kind of create this separation between your inner consciousness and your conscious mind. I always think in terms of who do you want to be when you grow up? You know, we're at that time in life, whether you're a boomer, Gen X, high-end millennial, high-end millennial may be a little early, but no matter, there's no reason to limit yourself. Yeah. Just let the ideas flow yeah. on the page. Yeah. Don't, th don't overthink it. Enjoy the process and look at the questions that you're posing for yourself because yeah. they've been in there all along. Yeah. You're just giving them permission think, to come out. Yeah, I mean, I actually find millennials very, very uh, compatible and interested in this process because for whatever reason, the way they've been raised or the world that we live in, uh, self-awareness and this kind of introspection is very much a part of millennial culture. And I think it's phenomenal because they don't balk at this process at all. They're going, oh yeah, right, okay, good. Let me just get right on that. You know? right. uh, at, whereas older people tend to kind of cross their arms a little bit and say, well, you know, how does that make sense? You know, I'm supposed to be submitting a resume and why? It's like, dude, just trust me, we'll Chill. back up, back up a second, Chill. right? And, and, and understand this is about making you a stronger candidate. Right. Because the fact is, folks, it's not like you're going to be sending out resumes and getting hired all that often. Statistical probability of that is very low, especially yeah. as we record this, 44 million people have lost their jobs in the last couple of months. Right. Right. And if you think all of them are going to be going back to work at their same employers, I'd like to know what, what you've been smoking lately, because yeah. it's not going to happen. Right. If we're lucky, and this is a real optimistic number, two thirds of them go back. That leaves 15 million on top of the previously unemployed. Yeah. And that's before we even get to the, to the wow. huge economic disruption that's coming in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. I mean, th this is really the, you know, th this is happening in a very rapid sequence, but it is, it's something that has been in the works for a long time and was going to happen anyway. Um, it's just, it's just the, 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 the turnover, uh, I mean, for remote work, number one, right? But, but all sorts of shifts in the society and culture are happening because of this pandemic and, and it's not gonna recover. Uh, there, there, we are not going back to the way it was. There will be a new normal. We don't know what it is yet. Uh, it's gonna have to adjust and we have to be very, uh, What's the word? We have to be uh, very adaptable. Well, we have to be adaptable. We have to be kind of self-aware around what is it that I do that I used to do in my old gig. What is that? Where is that relevant and applicable to the way things are going? So we have to be really uh, studious about observing what's going on out there, and we have to understand not just in terms of the external functions that we used to do, but for example, you know, a bank teller. Why does a bank teller love what they do? Very often they will say, I love the contact with the customer. I love the problem solving. I love the transaction. Uh, well, that doesn't mean they have to work in a bank, right? There are going to be other customer related problem solving positions, which are going to continue to be in high demand because people continue to have problems with uh, business process and technology. Super, I love the dog. What kind of dog do you have? We have two, we have an Australian Shepherd and a Border Collie mix. I love the background. Don't worry about it, please. So, okay. what's, so what's next for people? What's the next thing they need to move on to? The next thing is really once you've, once you've worked out, once you've kind of got this flow going, 
uh, in your in your journal, and you've begun to question the limiting beliefs that you have held and kind of open up to new possibilities around what you could do, what you could be doing, how you could progress from uh, the job that you're at to something that pivots off of that job. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I love to invite people to do is, is if, they've, if they're working and they're unhappy in their current job is how could you reinvent yourself in your current job for your current company? You know, is there a way that you could be doing what you want to do at that company and shift into that role? It might be a win-win. They might be thrilled that you're stepping up and daring to suggest that you could do something different, something more, something that's actually more appropriate to your time in life, to what you've learned about the work that, that you do and that they do. So that's a, that's a really interesting possibility as part of a reframe. But then you have to figure out what is the value proposition. And this is a really big nugget in the whole process here, particularly if you're going to be the person who is self-responsible for your career, right? You want to be able to go into that job interview, as we were saying before, and have a really clear idea of here's who I am, here's what I do, here's why you need me, here's the situation going on in your company that is, you know, the, where your bench is thin, and I'm the guy who can come in and and, and help you out, or the or the gal. And one of the, so, I'm sorry for ahead. interrupting. I yeah. also want to add on to what you've said because some organizations and some professions don't let, lead themselves to a transition within your existing firm. You might explore the option of doing something on the side outside of the existing firm to experiment with it so that in this way you could try it out. Yeah. One of the issues that show up in this kind of work, like, yeah. do you know how to market yourself and your abilities so that people come to you right. or not? Absolutely. So, right. So regardless of what your strategy is going to be, whether it's reinventing yourself inside your company, whether it's starting a side gig that really focuses in on the stuff you really love to do and you're building that up from, from scratch or perhaps a hobby or an avocation that you've done, but realize that there is a money-making opportunity there, you start the side business. Um, whatever the strategy is that you're going to do, you need to figure out that value proposition, right? It's the, it's the collection of things that you do, the particular unique secret sauce of how you do it, and the, uh, the, the results that you're going to generate, the impact that it has on the people who you work with, the financial bottom line, uh, all of these factors have to go into that value proposition. And this is where LinkedIn becomes this amazing opportunity for us to create the value proposition, market it out to our network, and then use that networking cycle to spread the word to more people, to get ourselves known and acquainted with, uh, with people who are interested in what we have to offer and who will be able to refer us so that we're part of that 85% that's getting referred into jobs, clients, opportunities, et cetera. It makes a huge difference. And you know, as I told you before, and folks, you may know this about me already, I'm LinkedIn member 7653 of the more than 650 million people currently on the platform. I spotted an idea that was barren at that point. It, had, it was an interesting idea, but there was a ghost town that existed there. I, you know, it was the Wild West. It was before we really kind of understood social media. and It was, uh, it was one of a number of, of potential networks out there. And uh, it's like, who remembers MySpace? Who remembers Friendster? I do, I do. Long since gone, obviously. And there were high five. I don't know if that's still around in, in, a, in a different form, but there's so many different networks. And yeah. you know, Reed Hoffman had started a previous one before LinkedIn that didn't go anywhere, but this is the one that kicked. So LinkedIn is so important for your professional development because it's a place where you can build your brand and build your reputation so that people learn that this is what your expertise is and thus you can begin the process of the professional 
transition into the new role or complement the current role with this extra piece that's going to allow you to differentiate yourself. And now I'm going to use the dirty B word that most people find. So, oh, I don't know about brand, build your brand. Um, because they don't like to think of themselves as being like toilet paper and paper towels. But they are. And they right? don't like that. The and pandemic. people are, but I know, and, and, that, and that's a limiting belief, right? That's a, that's a kind of a strange disconnect because there's nothing wrong with being valuable, with being a sought after, valuable, trusted entity. And that's what Sherman is, I'm sorry. So I but start squeezing the Sherman. <laughs> right. But if you're, if you're going down the shopping aisle and you're a fan of that brand, you're, you know, you're, you're uh, tunnel vision trying to find that brand could be Skippy peanut butter, but whatever that is, uh, you want to be that sought after entity. Um, and that's what a properly crafted, eloquent, value proposition expressed through your LinkedIn profile is going to do for you. So you can, you know, you, you can, uh, you can poo poo the idea of brand. And, and I, I, I mean, we can kind of do a little conversation. This is why do you think people are so averse to the idea of being a brand because they don't want to think of themselves as something what manufactured or commoditized. Um, and, and what's hysterical to me, you know, this is one of the examples I give. When people go to the store and they have to buy detergent to do their laundry, I've never known of anyone who picks up two packages of detergent, look at the list of ingredients and go, ah, the interrelationship of the chemicals in this one is going to do a better right. job of cleaning my laundry than this one. Right. You know, what, Unless they're a chemical engineer. And even then, they're told by their wife, husband, or partner. They've got a right. coupon. It's the price. Right. You know, this is what gets in the way. Of sure. this, this varying form of cost-benefit analysis that goes on that right. translates into, I'm going to buy this one. <laughs> and they just reach for it. You, know, you bring up the word commodity, which I think is a really interesting word when you think about the marketplace today. And because pretty much everything in the consumer space has been commoditized. And... You know, what's the difference between a Hyundai and an Acura, you know, or, you know, uh, a, 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 a Samsung TV and a Sony TV, right? They're all kind of the same. And you're kind of looking for specials and deals and maybe a review, you know, or something going on. And I think what's, what's different today is that the differentiation happens on the experience level. It's your experience of the brand or of the product that is the product, right? It's not the product itself. So similarly, the employer, recruiter, hiring manager's experience of you is what differentiates you in a commoditized job search world. So if you uh, if you object to the idea of seeing yourself as a brand because you feel like a commodity, this is exactly the way to get out of that commoditization and distinguish yourself as something special and unique. And that something special is something that I coach about because when you think about it in most parts of the country, Folks, you're not the only person who can do this job that you're interviewing for. You are competing with other people. Other and, competent people. Yeah. And thus, the question comes down to what makes you different? What makes you special in the way that's going to make them go, ah, oh, John, yeah, you. Yeah, I want to hire you. Years ago, there used to be the concept of IBM that no one ever got fired by buying an IBM computer. And you want to be the right hire for people so that when you walk in the door, they're favorably disposed to you because they've gotten a referral from someone or there's social proof about you. They can read about you or watch you or listen to you online. Heck, when people come to me for coaching, often they've watched a bunch of my YouTube videos 
at JobSearchTV.com or listen to No BS Job Search Advice Radio, which, by the way, is the number one podcast and Apple podcast for job search. By far, yeah, more than 1,800 episodes at the time of this recording, episode 2,000, and 10 years of doing this later this year, they already know a lot about me because otherwise they don't know how to choose between coaches. And this is why the LinkedIn profile is so vital. And not just having your, your resume transposed to your LinkedIn profile, but to actually have an expressive profile that uses all of the um, features inherent in LinkedIn to serve your agenda. So if, you, if you've done the pre-work, you've done your, your journaling, you've kind of gotten over you know, your limitations and your old ideas about what works and what doesn't work and who you are, now you can start to put together this full rainbow picture of the value that you provide within this searchable LinkedIn profile structure. And what's really important, I think, to do that, to distinguish yourself, to make you that person that you're talking about, that people notice and people say, yeah, we want that kind of guy or gal in our organization, is to get rid of all of the formality that we were taught around crafting a resume and crafting a bio. If I see a bio today, whether it's on LinkedIn or otherwise, that is written in the third person, I either turn the page or laugh or both because it's ridiculous. In a much more transparent world that we live in today, you've got to write about, I mean, everyone knows who's written that bio. You know, you didn't have some corporate publicist write that bio for you, you wrote it. So refer to yourself in the first person reach out to the reader in an authentic, personal way to strike up that relationship uh, because that's how you're going to get through the noise. And if I see another LinkedIn profile about section that starts in this disembodied way, proven, oh, fill, God. In blank, proven fill in the blank leader, uh, Hi, ROI. Visionary, visionary, visionary leader. You know, uh, all of this BS corporate speak, not all, it's going to turn off the very people that you're trying to reach. If you think that you are helping yourself by trying to be impressive and be a third party, you know, from on high kind of uh, a professional expert, visionary, whatever, you are fooling yourself. People don't want to see that. They want what I call this high concept approach to marketing, which is in one really quick, uh, expressive hook statement, you open up all sorts of possibilities about the real person on the other end of that profile. And so you, you've, you've got to be the first person. You've got to be personal. You've got to talk about why you do what you do, not what you do, right? They want to know who you are more so than they want to know what you do. The what you do part is going to be in your experience section, which is the equivalent of your resume. And you don't have to cram it into two pages. You can put it as much as you can put it as long as you want. But in that about section, which they're going to see before they get to your resume, they want to know that you're a real person with real values, real motivation. They want to hear from you personally. It makes a huge difference. You know, I started gasping when you use those BS expressions. It was like, I remember the last visionary person I saw, um, you know, I said to them, so tell me about what you've done that's been so visionary. And it was nothing. This is such but trivial work. Even if it is visionary. The uh, people who says, say it's visionary aren't visionary. Yeah, I mean, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant to the task at hand, right? Yeah, it's ridiculous. So what haven't we covered yet that we need to, to help the, uh, the viewers and the listeners 
uh, get the points for laying out their future? Well, I think beyond the, the, uh, the successful crafting of that LinkedIn profile, uh, and by the way, the headline, I just want to say something about the headline. A lot of people put their job title in their headline. It's a big mistake. Uh, remember that the, that the profile is being searched. You're being searched. And if, you know, if you put your title in the headline, you're going to limit yourself to just that narrowly defined title of the work that you currently do. If you have an ambition to go beyond that, you want to be much more um, all-encompassing in your headline uh, and talk about the various aspects of the value that you provide, not the role necessarily, uh, or the single role that you do. You've got 125 characters. You can put two, three, four different little snippets in there that describe the, you know, a, maybe a, a, a noun and a descriptor that, that, uh, that kind of give a sense of what is the range of um, work that you, that you do, uh, that you want to do, that you can do. So just a side note on that. But the point I'm leading to is that this is about your network. You know, you're not on LinkedIn to just put up a poster and forget about it and just hope that people find you. You need to be active on the platform uh, and you need to be networking. So the, you know, the, and those are two different aspects of the connection work that you need to be doing to start to be proactive with your career and create this, this next position for yourself. Uh, and, and the one thing I always tell people is you have to be a little patient with the networking. I know this may be your A plus priority, but for the person receiving your message, it may be a C. And I know people often feel disappointed that they're not getting responses in a quick enough manner for them. But the dirty little secret of LinkedIn is that people aren't on it all day and all the time like they are on Facebook, for example. Right. They check in from time to time and it's gotta be a well-crafted note uh, in, that you send through the LinkedIn Messenger to people. That's yep. going to make them want to respond and and comments on posts, right? right. So yeah, uh, I mean, I think here's the here's the I mean, as you say, it takes patience, and and the the problem is if you are on the street, out of a job, and you need another job, what we're talking about today is not necessarily going to be a quick fix for you, and the the you know, this tendency that we have in our culture to kind of say, well, what do I have to do to fix it? Just tell me what I have to do. It just doesn't apply. And I get it. A lot of people are in dire straits. They need to get hired. And I, I never, I will never say to someone, this is the only thing you need to do. Uh, and I don't care that you need to get a job. You need to spend six months networking and, uh, and, and mining your your connections on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, just gonna, means, I'm just going to well, inject one thing here. And that is folks, everything works in job hunting. Every last idea that you have just never works right. frequently enough. Right. Well, but I think you've got to, if, if you need a job, you've got to apply to jobs, right? You've got to pull out all the stops and you've got to be systematic about it. And you've got to make your list of everyone, you know, every potential company that you can get a connection to, and again, LinkedIn is good for that. You know, do your research and, and be proactive about it. But in terms of long-term success, to really get out there authentically, providing the value that you alone can provide, uh, it's a longer process, right? So you, you, but you, want to, you want to start today. You want to start your journal today. You want to get your LinkedIn profile going today. You want to connect with lots of, uh, uh, well, not lots of, but, but certainly targeted groups on LinkedIn where you'll find people who do what you do, uh, have the same point of view, uh, and you, you want to work your process. You want to spend some time every day uh, doing this. Agreed. What else, John? Is there more? I know there's a lot more we could cover. Well, I think it's important to organize your network, right? That, that's, a, that's a whole other aspect of, uh, of, the, of the work. 
Uh, and because I think a lot of people kind of go, well, you know, I got 1,500 names on my in my Rolodex, virtual Rolodex. Uh, what do I do? Just start calling everybody? And no, what you want to do is you want to do a little triage of that process. And I like to I like to divide the group into three uh, subgroups. And silver, gold, and platinum. The silver group is anybody that you have in your contact list. Uh, maybe it may just be a business card that you got at a networking event or a cocktail party who could possibly at some point be supportive and helpful for you in your career, but not today. Some, you know, when things shift, you want, you want to have them in the network. You want to have them in your awareness, but your goal group is the, real place where you're doing most of your most of your networking these are people who are colleagues uh, who uh, are associates uh, people that you worked with in some capacity friends of friends in in the business uh, people that you have some sense of currency with that you can go to and say here's my situation i want to if we haven't talked in a while i want to update you on what's been going on uh, what's going on with you you know because the key to successful networking is to always be giving. You know, if you want to apply the 80-20 rule to networking, 80% of your networking activity has got to be providing value to other people, not asking them for stuff in return. If you spend 80% of your time sharing articles, making other people, uh, connecting other people with one another, et cetera, then the 20% of the time you will get the the, the feedback and the, and the value back from your network uh, where they will uh, hook you up with other people, possible open positions, et cetera. And again, this takes time. Don't expect you're gonna get results immediately. You know, you've gotta give it at least six months to build a momentum where people understand who you are, where you are, what's going on, and you'll know who is responsive and who is not. You know, you, and unfortunately, adversity will bring the, uh, the, the people out of the woodwork that you never thought were going to be on your side and were, will disappoint you with the people who you thought were friends who it turns out may not be friends. So true. John, I know there's so much more we can cover because, you know, we, we both are experts at this. We live, we live this. Yeah. Right. We've, we've lived this every day for a long time. How can people find out more about you, the work that you do, things along those lines? Sure. So um, you can pick up the uh, book on Amazon, Boomer Reinvention, How to Create Your Dream Career Over 50. Uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, you know, all the, all the booksellers online have it. And uh, you can also visit my website, which is johntarnoff.com, J-O-H-N-T-A-R-N-O-F-F.com. And uh, if you want to uh, get into the weeds a little bit, I have uh, a ebook which you can uh, uh, sign up for at uh, go, G-O dot John Tarnoff dot com and the form will come right up and you can uh, pick up a copy of the book and it'll give you the first three steps that you can use to start your career transition process. John, thank you so much for making time and folks, I'm Jeff Altman. I'll be back soon with more. If you're interested in more information from me, visit my website, thebiggamehunter.us. I've got more than 9,000 blog posts there that you can watch, listen to, or read that'll help you with your job search, managing more effectively, hiring more effectively. You know, there's a lot of information available there, so go to the blog and go exploring. And if you happen to be interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, there's a button there that says schedule where you can schedule time for a session with me or schedule a free discovery call. I'd love to help you. Lastly, by the way, subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Click the small icon in the lower right of the picture of me in the upper left and get notified when I release something new. Hope you have a terrific day and be great. Take care.